joining us on special interview and we have the number two man. That's what um, they're usually referred to of Edo State, the Deputy Governor of Edo State, Philip Shaibo. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you very much. Uh, let's begin this interview by getting your thoughts about the recent amendment of the Constitution. Lots of things we are played out and um, people are complaining for different reasons and others are commending. What's your position on those uh, points that were raised during the amendment of the Constitution? Yeah, I think um, the only snag is the, the five uh, items that uh, came from the, from the women fold that were taken out. I think it was not fair uh, because uh, when we seek for election, including a member of the National Assembly, uh, I can bet you that all of them, including my good friend, the Speaker and the Senate President, uh, if you count the number of votes that they got to get to the National Assembly, I can bet that 70% of those votes are from women. So for me, I think uh, voting all the five items out was not fair. So that aspect, I think we need to revisit it. Uh, one of the ones I celebrate is the independent candidacy. Uh, I, I celebrate that one because um, of the kind of political parties that we have in Nigeria. And uh, they, they touch some, some of the things that I've been clamoring for. I, I actually feel that uh, uh, I was sharing with somebody before I saw it in their item that if I have the choice, I would like to contest election as an independent candidate because of what I see in the political parties. Uh, so I, I, I like that. Then the issue of um, autonomy for local government and autonomy for judiciary and autonomy for the legislative arm. I don't have a problem with it, but I have a problem with the process that it will take if they are granted autonomy. And what type of autonomy are we talking about? Is it financial autonomy or both financial autonomy and uh, administrative autonomy? Because if you talk about administrative autonomy, maybe that is where you can say there are problems. But in terms of financial autonomy, can the judiciary and the legislative arm stand independently financially? I don't think so. I was in the legislative arm. And, um, uh, during my time, we voted against it, not because we don't want independent, because we have independent in terms of what we do, but financially, we don't have that independent. And why is that? The Nigerian economy is not ripe to the extent that you grant financial autonomy. You know why? Because the legislative arm do not, uh, they don't have any system that they can raise revenue. But, but the, the, it's, it's simply and when you say when you say there should be a first line charge, that's exactly that which is the argument. And my own argument on the issue of first line charge is, I am in the executive now. I was in the legislative arm, and I'm seeing the difference. The executive have all the potentials to raise funds. The legislature does not have that. And when you say first line charge, it means that assuming hundred thousand naira is what the state is able to gather from internally generated form and, ex and money from Abuja or all external uh, money put together. For that month, they can only raise 100,000. And the legislative arm need to spend 90,000. The judiciary need to spend 90,000. The executive arm need to even spend 120,000. And you say, first line. That means who is now going to be given the first line? Is this the legislative arm that wants to spend 90,000 and you only have 100,000 for the state? Or the judiciary that wants to spend 70,000 you give? So if you have to do first line, that means you program your system the first to get. If the first to get is the legislative arm with 90,000, that means 10,000 is left for the executive and for the judiciary. The judiciary is saying they need 70,000. The, the executive said they need 120,000. So that means that 100,000 naira that have come cannot take the expense of the judiciary, cannot take the expense of the legislative arm, cannot take the expenditure of the uh, executive arm. So how do you go? So when you say uh, 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 first line, first line is when you have everything. OK, but in, in a situation where the, there is a proper budget, a proper budgeting system, 
where all the, uh, all the things that need to be spent are already put in, into consideration. They are already there and the budget is prepared. Now, whatever that is due to the, to the judiciary goes to the judiciary from source and not at the, you know, at the time that the executive wants to do it, it belongs to them. Whatever belongs to the legislature belongs to them. I think that's where um, the, the yeah. understanding of the autonomy yeah. will be yeah, easier. Yeah, that, that is why I'm saying that it will be difficult to spell. Before you talk about autonomy, you must spell out how to raise these funds and what to spend. First, will the legislative arm prepare their budget and approve for themselves? Will the judiciary, judiciary, okay, you can excuse the judiciary. They will, the legislative arm is the one I'm really concerned about, not even the judiciary, because judiciary on both sides, they, the, they are the one that, that you really need to deal with in terms of what they need because of their own calling. Their own calling, they are not the political arm. The legislative arm and the executive arm is where the issue really, the politician, that is where the real issues are. Okay. You can deal with the, uh, the, the, the judiciary, they are conservative. So you can deal with their issue in terms of autonomy, you can deal with the issue. But the legislative harm, that's where I have serious problem. Okay. Because will the legislative people, uh, the harm of government, prepare and pass its budget? If they will, I like being factual, because I was in the legislative arm. We will prepare our budget as a legislator. We will approve it for ourselves as legislators. And it will now go to the executive. Assuming the executive refused to sign that budget, because what is contained in that budget will overshadow the expenditure of the two, other two arms. There will be, then there will be problem between the executive and the legislative arm. Many, many people will argue that it's okay to have the, the law there and then how to implement it will now be left in the hands of the operators, the executive and the legislature, yeah, it, it, provided yeah. they have the interest of the state or the country at heart. But maybe we just move on from there and yeah, look at, I, I look can at tell you that. that both arm of government, especially the legislative arm and the executive arm, that is where the the issue of that's why I say what type of autonomy are we talking about? Is it administrative or financial? So we it has to be defined. Let's leave that and then um, move on. But still talking about the local government, you yeah, you, local government. Yeah. Legal, I mean, a do state. Beg your pardon. Um, this is one year. The local government where this, you know, the antenna ran out and administration at that level had been handled by civil servants. Um, I may just want to find out when are we expecting the local government election in a state? Yeah, uh, uh, definitely it has to be before the primaries. Uh, preparation is on uh, to have the local government election before the primaries. The, uh, the INEC timetable is out and I can assure you that uh, we'll have a local government election. The discussion are still on. I think any moment from now, uh, the governor will, will be telling us and uh, when this will be happening. But I can assure you that we'll have our elections before the primaries. Okay. Okay. Of the general elections. All right. Before we settle down to a door proper, let's just take one more uh, you know issue that concerns everyone, and that is about the general election that is fast approaching. There are different thoughts. Some are not very comfortable. They believe that this 2023 election may not be different from other elections that have been conducted in Nigeria. Some others are optimistic, though without any evidence for their optimism. Where do you stand? Do you think that what has happened so far is signaling an improved election in Nigeria, a freer, fairer election by 2023? Yeah, I think um, for me, uh, with the signing of the electoral law and, um, and with the improvement I see from INEC in every election, I have that hope that something better will happen in 2023. Uh, but don't forget that interests are always there. And don't forget that the ruling party will not want to just give up, give up the, the power. So it has to be a well contested for election. And that is where other parties, including my party, the PDP, need to actually go back to drawing board and actually uh, organize. If we are able to organize, I see us there. But if we are not, obviously, they will just have. And don't forget, Nigerians now do not vote for political party again. They vote for individual. They now see beyond politics, uh, political party. They see 
they want they want to vote for people they feel that they, there's hope for what the Nigerian that they want. So for me, I, the, 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 the trend that we saw in Edo, um, also seen such a trend in the 2023 election, where it's all about individual, not just political party. And if, if what I'm thinking and what I'm seeing on the street is true, obviously we just need to have the right candidate. And when we have the right candidate in any of the political party, I can tell you that Nigeria will go for that person, not for the political party. Okay, let's come down to your primary constituency, which is a Edo State. Um, the state has had a history of having um, high-profile criminal activities. We, many, many people will remember the, in the late 80s, the Lawrence Anini, and then quite recently during the NSAS or after, aftermath of the NSAS, the first place that prisons were attacked, correctional facilities as they are referred to now, were attacked was in Edo State. And tell us how you have managed, or your administration, where you function, had managed to stabilize and perhaps um, clean up Edo State a little bit to have a relative, you know, better record than what it used to be in the past. We have a visionary governor, and um, we working together with him, we were able to put up a, an, an elaborate and well-structured security architecture, even before the NSAS. And that's what actually helped us uh, to be able to manage the jailbreak. Because elsewhere, outside uh, in developed country and even developing countries and states, that each incident like that has happened, it takes like one to two years to be able to restructure and get crime out of that state. But because we already have a structure on ground, that was what actually helped us to be able to deal with it, that it didn't go up to a year and uh, we were able to maintain the level of security that we got. Where uh, during the last Christmas, for instance, everybody was excited, happy that it was crime free. And when we check the statistics of crime between October to January, it was, it was marvelous until the, uh, the Euromi incident. Uh, what we have just done is we are domesticating security. We are making communities to be part of the security architecture of the state. And we are making uh, uh, the wards to develop their own security ar architecture in line with the state structure, working with the traditional rulers, working with the communities, working through which we were able to form the vigilante group. And this vigilante group, uh, we are also profiled by the SSS and the Nigerian police so that we don't have another uh, group of persons that are, not, that are uncontrollable. So, uh, so, so that architecture between the federal agencies and the states and the locals that are actually help us. Look at the Oromi incident, for instance. The recoveries and, that we've had so far was as a result of the activation and cooperation of the communities. Uh, so w w without uh, that cooperation and collaboration, it will have been a 100% uh, sweep by those armed robbers. But because of that collaboration, we were able to block the youths, the women, everybody were able to block certain areas in collaboration with the security agency. And that, that helped us. And so far, I can tell you that from that incident, we've gone back to the drawing board again. There are other things we are put in place within that period. Does that affect the reports we hear about uh, invasion of some areas by headsmen? We hear of uh, Ovia Southwest local government. How are you dealing with that? Because that's creating a lot of threats, yeah. you know, to you know local uh, security. Yeah, I think the problem of Ovia, you know, there is the Omotekums, the the own security architecture from there. Some of them that have been driven are finding their way this way. And, uh, and, and that is what is resulting to what we have there. For some time, we've been able to deal with it. And we've discovered uh, that we need to, to block our borders because most of these guys coming out are coming from Mundo and other axes. So uh, I will not want to give you detail, but we are doing certain things and we are putting certain things in place to make sure that we not only block, but some of them that are already in, we are able to deal with it. 
Okay. Uh, last year, you threatened to leave your party, the PDP. A lot of people had different views about it. That was the party on whose platform you and the governor won your second term um, election. But now it appears the nerves had come now. Tell us how you managed it. And um, is it something that is still cooking or brewing somewhere? Or has it been finally dealt with? Yeah, uh, I joined PDP not because I want to join PDP. But you wanted to win an election? No, not because I wanted to win an election. I didn't join because I wanted to win an election, or did I join because I wanted to join? I joined because the governor was being oppressed. And for me, I hate oppression. And because the governor was being oppressed, and he was being oppressed by somebody that introduced fighting oppression. And I decided that I must join the governor to fight against that oppression. And when it was time, we called a meeting. And from that meeting, our leaders in APC then, and our party executives and our party leaders, we met after the governor was disqualified. We met, and I wanted AA. But they said, no, we should not go to AA, that we should go to PDP. So the decision to go to PDP was actually by the then APC state executive and world executive and the party leaders. And we didn't have any choice than to follow the lead of our leaders in APC, most especially the party executive. And they say, if we go, they will resign their membership. So you can imagine somebody that is a board chairman, somebody that is a state chairman, and executive member saying, we will leave the party if you go to X and we'll follow you. So based on that, we waited for the governor's uh, decision because he is the one that was being oppressed. And when he took that decision that, yes, he will contest, and the party say, we will leave this party to this other one. And we said, okay, go and try. And fortunately for us, the party that is our executive in APC and leaders say we should go, they accepted us and gave us a ticket. And I made one statement. I said, I am only following the governor to PDP. I am following the governor. Wherever he goes, I go. So that is it. Whether there is tension in PDP now or not, for me, I don't see myself as a PDP person up to now because I have not been accepted in PDP. Is the governor has been accepted, but I have not been accepted. Okay. Yeah, the governor has been accepted because the governor was accepted. That is why we took the ticket of PDP. Me, Philip Shaibu, and other party members of APC that came to join, up to now, have not been accepted. And we formed the majority even in PDP. So, and for me, I will not abandon my state chairman, Asne Mujizwa, or my chairman in my local government, or my ward chairman in my local government and the executive, and just relax in PDP, say I'm fine. No, it's not about the governor, it's not about me. It's about the people that say we should go to PDP. They ask us to go to PDP. So we, and they, they cannot pick two of us and leave the rest. So for me, I'm a member of PDP because I fought on the side of the governor against oppression. So okay. up to now, I am a member of PDP because the governor has asked us. But if you ask me, and that's why I said from the beginning, if I have my choice in, in future election, and if the constitution is signed and there's independent candidacy, I would prefer to contest as an independent candidate than to contest under any political party for now. Okay, let, let, let me, let, let's leave this here because it's obvious that there are still lots of things going on and from the way you sound, you are on top of it, you, are, you understand it, you analyze it and you're you know, following it. But you, you mentioned that you left with the governor because the governor was oppressed by someone who fought oppression. You ended it there, you didn't yeah. mention name. So I will respect that, I will respect that. But yeah, tell me about, tell me oh, about no, your oh, former no, no. friend. Oshomole oppressed my governor. Okay, so you want to mention the name now? Yeah, yeah. Oshomole oppressed my governor 
by going to disqualify him. He was your boss. Of course. You were quite it, loyal Oshomole, to him. Oshomole was not my boss. Okay. Oshomole was like a father to me. All right. He's not just a boss. No, it was, it was not a boss and uh, a worker relationship I always remember. No, no, no. It's father and son relationship. And he taught me. Will it be right to say you betrayed him? No, 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 no. He taught me. You see, the Bible says, teach your children the way of the Lord. So that when they grow up, they will abide and they will do those things. Oshomole taught me how to stand as a man and fight oppression. And when he, he was teaching me those lessons, he never attached any name to it. He said, anybody that stands on your way or oppress anybody, the man in you should be out to fight against such oppression. And unfortunately, he, what we fought on his side against the late Chief Aneni, and we succeeded, is what he now wanted to do to my governor. And I have to fight. So it's, it's purely so it's based purely, on principle. It's principle. Okay. I have no problem. He's still my, Oshimales is still my father. Okay. And recently, I announced it publicly that I see my father. But it's just that on, he was trying to oppress somebody, and I didn't. And, and he, taught you, he taught you how to resist and he, oppression. And, and, every, and I'm sure Oshomole will be proud of me. I can tell you, deep in his heart of Oshomole, he will be pl proud of me. Okay. And he will be glad that those lessons that I learned from him, I'm taking it to another level. OK, very, very, very good. We will wait to see if we can find him to confirm whether he's proud of you. But um, Edo State has spent so much in sports, and uh, quite recently, the state hosted the National Sports Festival. The record um, of your input into running the sports project or festival it, it speaks for itself. So tell us how you were able to manage the back and forth movement at that time. It was quite dramatic. Today is holding, the next day is changed, and all of that. How did you manage it? Because you were in the forefront then, and then it landed eventually, and the results are showing. Yeah, I want to thank God. First, it's, uh, it's God I have to thank, and uh, also thank the governor for uh, appointing me to head the LOC. But I must also tell you that the success of the National Sport Festival was because we, we had a team that was determined to make a difference. So the LOC, working also with the MOC, we, 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 we set a standard, and that standard we were able to follow. The governor gave us mandate, and that mandate we were able to achieve as a team. I was just there to coordinate. And, uh, and when I look back and I saw the input that these team members put in, that has actually led to this uh, success that we are celebrating. But one good thing that I saw, that, um, which was almost a snag, was COVID, uh, which led to a lot of this postponement. And the curtain of uh, opening ceremony and closing ceremony that we'll have had, if not for COVID, will have been more than what we are celebrating now. Okay, in one minute, could you just, just mention them? You have done over 70% of your tenure as governor and deputy governor in your administration. Um, what do you think this government will be remembered for? Just itemize them. Because of lack I think the, the, one of the major things this government will be recognized for is not something tangible that you can see. And it's the most important in all governance structure that, uh, that any state or a country should deal, deal with. And that's the issue of institutionalizing everything that we are doing. We have, we have done a lot of reform that you cannot see. But I can tell you, in another four or five years, the reform that have taken place in this engine room, which is, which is in civil service, because the engine room, the real government is the civil service. We've had a lot of reform in the civil service. And that, those, those reforms started about four years ago. We are gradually getting to a level that is becoming seen in the surface. But I can tell you, in another four to five years, Hedo engine room will be at top okay. level. So that is one major thing that I can tell you we have achieved. For infrastructure, it's a given. In the, in the in, in 21st century, Nigeria should not be celebrating infrastructure as gains, because that is supposed to be a given. 
But because of lack of previous, previous government, lack of building this infrastructure, and that is why we still celebrate, people still want to commission. In Edo, we don't commission some of these things. We allow the people to commission them. So infrastructure is something that we also can be remembered for, especially the inter those uh, uh, link routes within the rural area, within the city, go around, you see all the rural areas, all the link roads, we are dealing with them. And we do not build infrastructure for building sake. We build infrastructure for a purpose. Okay, let, let, we, we may not have so much time. Just to, before I let you go, it will be unfair if I don't find out from you after this tunnel, where is Philip Schreiber heading to? We hear that you want to become the next governor of Edo State. How true is this? Well, where I'm going after this is in the hands of God. And in all my elections, I've always listened to the voice of God. And majority of all the elections I've contested, I pray fast and I get the voice of God. And don't forget that the voice of the people at all times is the voice of God. Have they started speaking? No, now? I think for now, we are all discussing electoral reform. We are all discussing constitution. We are all discussing uh, whether we are still a member of PDP or not. We are still in that stage. So until we are sure we are a member of PDP, to now start working, to now know how to work in PDP to achieve results because general elections are coming. So until those things are done, and that is when we now start knowing whether uh, we can now start the other, the, the, the other level. But I can, I can tell you that whether I'm going to contest an election, yes, I'm going to contest an election. But which of the elections, whether it's governor, senate, or even the presidency, I can tell you I don't know yet. Okay. But one thing you should know is that I will still contest an election. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Philip Shaibu, the deputy governor of Edo State. We appreciate your time on this Thank interview. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And that's where we are dropping it at this time. It's our pleasure that you watched. Thank you.